Anyone who believes in indefinite growth on a physically finite planet is either mad or an economist. We don't want to focus politics on a notion that involves the rejection of principles around which a large majority of our fellow citizens organize their lives. We are not as endlessly manipulable and as predictable as you would think. Biology has shaped the way men and women cooperate and has done so since prehistory. And the lesson of how it has done so is still important for understanding the way men and women cooperate today. But in particular, I focus on the fact that women have paid a price for the way in which we cooperate. And it's a price that we can understand better if we dig uh, sufficiently hard into the roots of our evolutionary past. I think the first and important lesson is that conflict is at the heart of cooperation. Conflict and cooperation are two sides of the same coin. It's when you have a lot to cooperate about, when you have potentially large gains from cooperation, that there is so much temptation to, to be in conflict about the terms under which you do that. It's pri precisely because when uh, parties have a lot to share from cooperation that the question how those gains are to be shared becomes so urgent and so difficult. The uh, central idea that anybody studying economics looks at is scarcity. Different resources are differently scarce and the value of those resources reflects their scarcity. Now the really striking thing about sexual reproduction is the different scarcity of the gametes, the sex cells that the two sexes bring. Eggs in any species that has females and, and males, which not all species do, are scarce. They're larger than the male gametes. They typically come with some nutritional resources and there are not very many of them. So women, female, uh, human beings produce uh, an egg uh, at a rate of one a month. Male produce a thousand sperm a second. Now, it's because the obstacles to fertilization are not merely lo logistical. They're about the negotiation of the male and the female interests in reaching fertilization that the most interesting and difficult questions about sexual reproduction arise. And notably, what has happened is that natural selection has selected for selectivity in females and persistence in males. Why selectivity? Because females who have this scarce resource don't wish to waste it on unsuitable males. And males who find themselves uh, in uh, excess compared to the uh, limited number of available uh, female gametes uh, will then undertake all sorts of strategies, some very manipulative, some very persuasive, some very seductive, some very violent, to uh, ensure that their gametes are selected over and above all of the competing ones. The male persistence has tended to take one of two broad types. Um, this was something that uh, Charles Darwin wrote about in his great book, The Descent of Man, and he was fascinated by the way in which male persistence sometimes expresses itself through force, through violence, either through fighting between rival males or force exerted on females by males. And sometimes it's expressed itself through signaling, uh, through competitive signaling to try to induce females to cede to the charms of the male signalers. Conflict between males and females occurs even over something as simple as where to and how to mate. Um, females, after all, have mating opportunities which are scarce, which should not be wasted. And for males, those mating opportunities are potentially not so scarce, and a male that mates in one context is still able to mate relatively soon afterwards. Unlike a female for whom mating involves a major commitment of her body, of her resources. Here are the antennae of a water strider. Now the relatively delicate antennae on the left belong to the female. The antennae on the right involve some grappling hooks that appear to have evolved for the sole purpose of holding down recalcitrant females. So these are adaptive uh, pieces of anatomy that unfortunately, uh, appear to have no other purpose. And what they illustrate is a point that is worth coming back to again and again, which is that natural selection never selects for optimal or adaptive relationships. Na natural selection selects for particular traits which may be adaptive in the sense that they get themselves copied. 
but it's quite possible for the traits in the female to get themselves copied and the traits in the male to get themselves copied and the result to be messy, violent, inefficient, wasteful. Now, you might think that against that, signaling behavior is uh, likely to be a rather pleasant sort of thing and indeed a rather efficient sort of thing. But though omnipresent, though essential, is hugely wasteful. So the poster child for the wastefulness of signaling is the, the peacock. It's hard to imagine an appendage that could be more unlikely to help the bird to hide from predators, to escape predators, in, in general to survive and uh, leave its offspring, but it grows it because the female has learned to prefer it. And females prefer large tails, not for arbitrary reasons, but because these are known to be correlated with other indicators of fitness in the male. Now, one of the things you notice is that precisely because of the asymmetry that I described in terms of the scarcity of the, of the gametes, this means that the signaling tends to be done by the uh, sex with the abundant gametes. So it's the males here who are signaling. This primate has the unusual feature that all of those individuals that you see there in the front row that look like males are actually females. And what it illustrates is something about what Homo sapiens has done. The signaling is being done by both sexes. They're signaling to each other. So there's bilateral signaling in Homo sapiens, which is a little different from many other species. The females are not having to uh, cope with any problem of the available quantity of males, but a good man is notoriously hard to find, and it could be that there's something about male quality that is scarce. Some species, like our own, have developed elaborate forms of signaling that are bilateral. Signaling to other people, not only members of the other sex, but also to our colleagues, our employers, and so on, is a very big part of the story about both what makes us human more generally and what holds us back sometimes from realizing the possibilities that our cooperative natures make uh, available to us. Now, the difference between us and most of the other animals really resides in the very large-scale cooperation that we have undertaken. We, in particular, we invested in something that doesn't exist on the same scale anywhere else in the animal kingdom, which is the long childhood. Our offspring are dependent on us for much, much longer than those of any other animal, and they require massively greater investment. And in particular, they require investment that mothers cannot make on their own. The kind of alliances that a mother needs to construct to look after her children don't just involve the biological father of the child, although they may do, but involve a whole coalition of other parties, including the grandparents of the child, including other males, other females uh, in, in a group. And essentially, life in forager societies for women was about building the alliances that were necessary to give your children the chance to survive. Millennia, actually more than that, millions of years of a division of labor that persisted throughout prehistory has essentially been abolished in a matter of a few decades by an unprecedented and extraordinary tide of female talent that has swept into large areas of economic life that were previously occupied only by men. What has happened since World War II has been spectacular. Women's participation in the labor force has risen from just under 30% to just under 60%. And in fact, if you include if you, women who do not have children under the age of five, their participation in the United States at least is as high as that of men. In particular, uh, women now occupy a small majority of jobs that the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics calls managerial and professional jobs. So by that criterion, it looks as though in some sense all of the important general areas of uh, previously male work have now been opened to women. And it's in the light of that extraordinary development and extraordinarily rapid development that the remaining puzzles seem even harder to understand. One is the fact that some occupations continue to have very low participation of women. So if we start with things like the fact that women make up only 32% of lawyers, 32% of physicians and surgeons, 25% of architects, you can then construct a list going down to some truly remarkable uh, statistics, such as that women make up only 1.2% of airline pilots. 
even within occupations, in those areas of modern economic life where real economic power is concentrated, women are startlingly scarce. So among the Fortune 500 companies that are the most important in the uh, US economy, less than 16% of board members are women and only 2.4% of chief executive officers are, are women. So whatever process has resulted in those kinds of outcomes, uh, you can start to imagine the large amount of female talent that must have been somehow overlooked or left out. And it's because of the truly impressive nature of the previous change and of the general change that I think that remaining asymmetry, that remaining discrepancy, uh, is so puzzling. There are psychologists who will tell you, I'll define talent or IQ or ability as you know, the mean of performance on test X and test Y and test Z. Um, what is very rarely offered is any reason why the mean of text X, test X, text Y and text Z should be the right measure. And without a theory of how to weight performances on these different skills together, I think we are a very, very long way away from any possible conclusion that there are systematic overall gender differences in talent. Now, if it's not talent, is it preferences? There are really three dimensions on which uh, there are systematic differences in women's preferences from those of men, partly for competitiveness and risk-taking, partly in terms of preferences for negotiating style, and then there are uh, fairly clearly documented differences in preferences for flexibility in working lives, um, with women being uh, systematically more likely to uh, prefer flexible hours, to take breaks early in their careers, and so on. Now, before you think that these differences in preferences are the answer, the puzzle is why the price paid for those differences in preferences is so high. In particular, it's not surprising, you might think, that a woman who maybe takes five years out of her career to raise children might be less able to earn as much as her peers when she returns to work, say, in her mid-30s. What's truly startling is that in her mid-50s, she's still paying a price for it. And it's very hard to think of a reason why those uh, things that have happened in the, in the uh, early to mid-20s should still be casting a shadow, a shadow as large as it is so many years later. So what is it about those differences in preferences that involves them in such a high price? And the missing element I want to suggest is those coalitions and networks that I signaled the importance to you of earlier. Women's networks seem to be more stable, more loyal, more based on trust, more based on, on dependability. And you can see reasons why in prehistory that was important. If your coalitions were the uh, thing that, on which your child's life depended, then you would be very, very careful about spending your time with people whom you couldn't <coughs> trust, with whom your links were purely superficial. Now, so stable, loyal coalitions sound like a good thing, and they were very important in prehistory. But in the vast, impersonal world of the modern corporation, they don't do enough to get you noticed. And the corporate world is full of many talented women who, in some sense, are flying beneath the radar of the still largely male recruiters to the top positions. Now, whether that's because of the way the women fly or whether it's because of the way the radar is calibrated is a whole new discussion again. And I think the evidence suggests that it's a bit of both. But what it does imply is that there are opportunities for recruiting talented women that the recruiters to the modern business world are systematically overlooking. Those opportunities are lying outside the boundaries of their still uh, rather narrow field of vision. Think back to the world of the forager society in which um, men and women would be signaling to each other not only about potential mating opportunities in the future, but about what the way they behaved with respect to the hunt, to, with respect to gathering, with respect to the raising of their children. Women would be signaling characteristics like conscientiousness, which we know from uh, labor market data today is enormously valued by modern employers, and they would be doing so in forager societies in a way that everybody could see them. Today's economy has separated the workplace from domestic life. So women who take 
some time to move from the workplace to domestic life, then spend several years, the most important years of their lives, in which they do some of the most valuable things that uh, they're available to do, signaling qualities which, did they but know it, their future employers would value. But the future employers are not around to observe those qualities. So, in some sense, what seems to be at work here is a problem of failed signaling in the modern workplace, which is costly to women's professional opportunities, but is actually costly to men too. If you think about the kind of signaling that men undertake when they work long hours in the office to convince a potential employer or an actual employer how committed they are to uh, the employer's interests and needs, then you must think to yourself that in the world made possible by modern uh, teleworking, uh, it should be possible to signal that degree of commitment in an easier way. So men who spend excessively long hours in the office to signal their commitment are just like those peacocks. They're using a wasteful mechanism, which is still adaptive for the individual, but if a better way could be found to signal those same qualities, it would be better for all concerned.